morning, uh, Dr. Jean Grande. Can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly, Sir Brian. And you can see me? I can, I can indeed, and good morning to you, sir. Well, that, that's quite a good start. Uh, the reason I say that uh, is for your benefit and for the benefit of those who are watching remotely. I'll describe the scene to you in a moment. Um, there have been one or two gremlins, uh, I'm afraid, with the transmission uh, online, generally. Um, they may uh, affect us this morning. It's, it's not here at the inquiry, but on the, between the inquiry and the, uh, the, the general world, and maybe you as well, uh, we have server problems. Uh, and if they cause us problems, I just hope that you and everyone else will, will bear with us. Um, I hope, that's the best I can say, I hope uh, that they don't come back to, uh, to uh, be real problems uh, and that um, what I'm saying now will simply be forgotten by the end of the day. But let me tell you uh, what uh, you, um, uh, you are facing uh, as you look at your, uh, your screen. Uh, in this room, uh, there are a handful uh, of lawyers. There are three lawyers from the inquiry. There is your own uh, counsel, Mr. Thomas, uh, then there are three members of the inquiry staff uh, and Mary, uh, who will swear you, uh, uh, Minister of the Oath, in a moment or two, together with uh, a technician whose job it is to show the various documents that we will be referring to. But it's not just us you're talking to. It, it is um, a, a very large number, probably around about 200, uh, of those who are uh, interested in the inquiry from different perspectives, uh, and they are watching uh, remotely. Many uh, would have wished to be here. You may well have wished to be here yourself, um, uh, and uh, it would have been my wish that that could have been the case, but it isn't because of the virus, the coronavirus this time, um, uh, that, uh, and as a result, um, we are where we are, uh, and I'm afraid that they, we have no option if we are to continue, but to uh, screen your evidence uh, remotely. So you will be seen by lots of people, you will be heard by lots of people, there will be a transcript, a running transcript, which will be um, corrected at the end of the day to make sure it's faithful to what you actually said, um, uh, and that's uh, where we are. Just so you now understand what the position is, uh, Mary will now uh, ask you to take the oath. I understand you want to swear on the Bible. I, I do, yes. yes. I'll take it from the right hand. Okay, okay. yes. Um, uh, please state your full name. Paul Leo Francis Jangrandi. And repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you. Uh, and Mr. Jane Grady, I should have uh, asked, you are, I think, at, at home on your own with your, your wife? I am indeed, yes. Thank you. Dr. Jane Grady, can you see and hear me? I can hear you perfectly and see you perfectly. I've had no problems with internet connection myself. Good. Well, I, I hope ours um, holds up as well. Uh, you qualified as a doctor in Manchester in 1979? Yes. And uh, your statement tells us that from 1979 to July 1981, you held various house officer and senior house officer posts in Manchester. C yes, can you assist right. us with um, the extent to which you undertook any haematology work during that time? Um, after I uh, got full registration, that is after my uh, house jobs, I then uh, undertook a rotation uh, at the University Hospital of South Manchester, colloquially known as Withington Hospital. And that involved uh, rotating around the four sections of uh, pathology because um, I knew I was likely to head in that direction career-wise. And that involved spending three months in each of uh, uh, microbiology, uh, chemical pathology, histopathology, and haematology. Um, and the, the haematology I did was largely laboratory-based, 
um, most of the clinical haematology was at Manchester Royal Infirmary. Uh, and did you work at all with Dr. Krask at that time? I did. He was the microbiologist, a virologist, I'm sorry, in the microbiology department. And I met him. Of course, I had no idea at that stage that he had any interest in the haemophilia world. And, and I didn't know I was going to be moving into that world either at that stage. But that's where I got to know him first. Now, you then moved to London in August of 1981. You were an SHO in renal medicine at the Hammersmith. Uh, yeah. And then uh, you moved to St. Mary's uh, in an SHO position in metabolic medicine. That's Just right. Yeah. dealing first with the uh, time spent in renal medicine, did you come across any dialysis patients who had been infected with blood-borne viruses at, at that time? No, it was very much a, a, an area of uh, a, it, where they took a lot of precautions and it was something that was greatly feared. So you know, great precautions were taken, absolutely, because... If a machine got contaminated, the potential consequences were enormous. And then I understand it was during the time at St Mary's that you first uh, came across reference to AIDS. That's right. I mean, the first death from AIDS in the United Kingdom was reported in December of 1981. Uh, a patient died in the Brompton Hospital. And, of course, others were... Uh, patients sadly were falling ill at the time and it was the subject particularly based in West London of educational uh, materials and, uh, and and talks and in fact I remember one uh, talk particularly well because uh, Dr Pinching who had previously been at the renal unit at Hammersmith Hospital had moved at roughly the same time as me and uh, I remember very well a, a talk he gave on AIDS when the cause was completely unknown and indeed I remember him telling us about a paper published in The Lancet, which was implicating, of all things, amyl nitrite poppers. But it was a respectable paper published in The Lancet from a very reputable group in the US. So it was taken seriously at the time. So that would have been late 1981 or, or, or the first part of 1982? Uh, 1981 was when I was there. I, I did look up. The publication on amyl nitrite was published in The Lancet on February the 20th. So because these educational talks tend to be given quite soon after the publication. I would guess that lecture was probably March, perhaps April of, 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 sorry, of 82. I'm sorry, I, I said 81, of 82. Uh, and then you completed your um, MRC PATH qualification, I think, at this no, time? No, the MRCP qualification in, uh, I think I got it yes. in June. The MRC PATH came later, that was 86. Well, we'll get to that in a moment then. You then, I understand from your statement, moved to Switzerland, where you worked from August 1982 to July 1983, including six months of haematology work. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, I mean, the background, first of all, it was a European exchange scheme that I applied for. It, uh, Hammersmith Hospital at the time was part of what was called the Royal Postgraduate Medical School, and there was an opportunity to spend a year abroad. So I applied for that. And um, when I moved to Switzerland originally, I, they let me do six months in internal medicine. Then they said, what would you like to do for the rest of your time here? And thinking of my future career, I decided to do haematology. And it was a very exciting time when I was there in Switzerland. There was a lot going on in haematology. And that's what made me determined to move into haematology. And do, do you recall whether there was any consideration or discussion at that time um, 82 through to July 1983, about the risks of AIDS that could be associated with the use of blood and blood products? Uh, not when I was in Switzerland, not at all. In fact, at the haematology department where I worked, we did uh, a lot of bone marrow transplantation, and they specialised also in treatment of patients with aplastic anemia. So very intensive use of blood products. And at that stage, there was no concern at all about HIV, and indeed, actually, in, I think, September or October of that year, um, I was offered a, a plasma-derived hepatitis B vaccine. And that was new to Switzerland. It had been produced in the United States. It wasn't yet available in the um, UK. And it's produced from plasma of American donors. And the whole point is it contains uh, hepatitis B from the plasma of these donors. It's not a recombinant vaccine. And it was offered to me by the hospital, and they wouldn't have offered it to me had there been any concern. And equally, I took it without any concern. Um, so, I, I should add, by the way, I am aware in retrospect from one of the papers that you sent me 
that in a report dated April the 24th of 1983, there were, and I didn't know this at the time, four cases of AIDS in, that had been reported in Switzerland. Actually, one of those was a resident from the US who'd come back for treatment of his final illness. So, so no discussion at all in, that, um, in the period that you were undertaking haematology work of AIDS? No, none at all. Actually, the story of Switzerland is quite an interesting one because the head of the Swiss uh, Blood Transfusion Service was a man called Professor Alfred Hessig, that's H-A-U-M-L-A-U-T, double S-I-G. And after a, a, a very stellar uh, career uh, as head of the Swiss Transfusion Service based in Bern, um, when AIDS came along, he was actually a bit of an AIDS denier, if you look up some of his work, and felt that HIV was related to stress and nutrition. And Switzerland didn't introduce HIV screening of blood donors until May of 1986. And indeed, there was no, uh, so there was no screening of donors, uh, there was no heat treatment of the local cryoprecipitate, uh, lyophilized cryoprecipitate they used to treat haemophilia. And in due course, Professor Hessig was actually prosecuted uh, and uh, got a, a year's suspended prison sentence in 1998 for criminal negligence. Um, that's mis uh, information you've gleaned subsequently, as I understand it. Yes, of, co of course, yes. Um, your next position was at the Westminster Hospital from August of 1983 to November of 1984, um, where you were a registrar in haematology uh, under Professor Barrett. Yes, that's right. Uh, and what did that work entail? Well, the interest of the Westminster Hospital um, was very much bone marrow transplantation. And indeed, Professor Barrett, who's still active, actually, clinically, I understand, um, is uh, it, that was what the Westminster was known for. So it was a general haematology hospital as well. But the main interest was the treatment of malignant disease. Um, now, Westminster was or did, did operate as a haemophilia centre. Um, and this was the first time, as I understand it from your statement, that you had any involvement with patients with bleeding disorders, but that involvement was limited to one patient. Is that correct? Well, that's the, the only one that I remember. We have to remember that the Westminster Hospital um, was just across... And by the way, the Westminster Hospital we're talking about, just to clarify, is not to be confused with the Chelsea and Westminster Hospital, which many people will know. The Westminster Hospital, which closed in 1992 was literally a few hundred yards from the Houses of Parliament and just north of Lambeth Bridge. And that's important because literally 10 minutes away was St Thomas's Hospital, which, of course, was a reference centre with dedicated haemophilia treatment experts and facilities. The uh, Westminster Hospital didn't have any of that. So you're right, it was technically classified as a haemophilia centre. Um, I only recall... One very, and I have to say, inspirational patient, I very much enjoyed talking to him, who had um, haemophilia B, and he used to come in for periodic um, self-infusion. Uh, like many adult patients at the time, he wouldn't trust the junior doctor with his veins, of course. Um, now, there may have been other patients, and I'm sure you're going to show me some treatment records from the UK HCDO database, but I only recall one patient with haemophilia B. In fact, I'm not going to show you any records related oh, right. to Westminster. Um, such yeah. records as we have do suggest a very um, small number of patients indeed. Um, can you recall, in relation to that one patient with whose treatment you were involved, what the product was uh, or the treatment was uh, that he was treated um, with? I'm afraid I, I can't remember offhand. I know that he he died a couple of years ago when he must have been in his 19... It must have been in his 70s, perhaps even beyond, actually. But he was a very inspirational guy. And it's no exaggeration to say, I think, you know, he helped me develop an interest in haemophilia, actually. Um, now, um, you attended uh, the a AGM of the UK HCDO in October of 1983. And we'll just have I a look... Yes, I mean, as background, I have to say it was a slightly extraordinary situation because I must have been by far the most junior person there. And quite why I say this after as a career as a you know, boss in a haematology department myself, uh, someone who's been in the job for two months suddenly gets asked to go to a meeting. I really don't know and understand. I would guess Professor Barrett realised the meeting was potentially important at this time, uh, received a letter with an agenda and I had to be the first doctor to walk past his door. And again, it was a decision that 
one of these fortuitous things in life which really lays the path out for future uh, career paths because, again, I developed an interest. But I was surprised to be sent. We'll just have a quick look at it, as much as anything, for the benefit of those who are, who are following your evidence, Doctor. Uh, it's PRSC 304440, please. So we can see from this, um, this is the uh, meeting on the 17th of October 1983, chaired by Professor Bloom. And if we go down the, the, the list, and there's a large list of attendees, if we just keep going down the page, we can see your name appears there uh, mm -hmm. representing uh, the Westminster Hospital, Dr. PLFG and Grandley, Westminster yeah. Hospital, London. Um, and if we just go over the page... Again, we can see a, a very long list of, of, mm -hmm. of actual attendees. And then if we go to the third page... If we go towards the top of the page, please, Shomik. We can see that um, Dr. Barrett, Westminster Hospital, has given his apologies and represented by you. So you were there in Professor yes. Barrett's stead. Yes, he was then Professor. They called him Doctor, but he was Professor Barrett. And could we go to page 10, please, Shomik? Um, you'll see here, Dr. Giangrandi, a reference under any other business mm -hmm. to... Um, uh, AIDS and a, an issue being raised by Dr. Chisholm, uh, who, who was a director uh, of the Haemophilia Centre in Southampton, um, and a discussion about reversion to cryoprecipitate, uh, and then a view expressed by Professor Bloom, a, a discussion ensuing, and then at the, at the end of the page, an agreement being recorded. Um, and if we just go to the next page, We'll, you'll see in the, under paragraph 10, current situation regarding AIDS, um, a, a presentation of a paper by Dr. Krask. Um, yes. Do, do you, Ursul, do you have any recollection of that meeting? I, I do. And in fact, what I remember from that meeting, and I have a striking visual memory of it, is indeed Dr. Scott giving details of the case of the patient that had died, the first death. It was a case that was reported subsequently in the Lancet in, 19, uh, in, in November. And I have to say that made a big impression. I, I can still see him in front of me, to my left, two rows along, uh, and I remember that presentation vividly. It was a bit of a shock to me, to be honest. And Dr. Scott, again, for the benefit of those who are following your evidence, was uh, a haemophilia centre director in Bristol. In Bristol. And that yes. was the patient who was the first haemophiliac patient to die in the UK in August yes. of 1983. Yeah. Your, your statement suggests, I think, that this was the um, first time you knew of the association between blood products and AIDS. Is that correct? Yes, definitely. This made a big impact on me. And, and do you recall anything of the discussion that we've seen recorded in the minutes about cryoprecipitate and Professor Bloom's views about there being no proof? No, I'm afraid I don't recall anything about that discussion. It wouldn't have meant much to me at all, I'm afraid at such a junior role. Um, we can see that you then attended the AGM the following year in, in 1984. And again, we'll just um, put that up on the screen. It's PRSE 30-3659. Yes, and while that's coming up, I mean, I, I, that was in Cardiff, and I remember it well. One of the good things about that meeting was after this meeting in Oxford, it was decided to have an educational day before the annual general meeting. And so it was ideal for someone like myself in training. And indeed, I remember Professor Manucci actually attended this meeting in Cardiff and uh, gave a lecture during the educational day. But I attended the AGM on behalf of Westminster in 84 and 85, and I believe 86 as well. Um, um other than um, the educational day, I think we've also heard it referred to as, as, as a scientific day. Um, well, and, the and, the, um, and the attendance of Professor Minucci. Do you have any other recollection of um, uh, the, the discussions at that meeting? I'm afraid I don't. Um, uh, and in terms of the work that you were still undertaking in Westminster at that time, um, was AIDS um, an, an active issue for the haematology department at Westminster? 
Um, not particularly, although I do remember in uh, 84 in September, the Cheng Song pop-off paper um, was published in the Lancet in September. It was the 1st of September. And actually, one of the authors was uh, then Dr. Brian Gazard. And although he gives his affiliation as St. Stephen's in that paper, he was actually, which is part of the Westminster group, he was a consultant gastroenterologist at um, uh, Westminster Hospital. And so clearly it was, you know, something that was talked about and we knew about it. So I certainly remember that particular publication. Um, uh, uh, sticking with 1984, um, a little earlier in 1984, there's an armour document that refers to you, um, Dr. Jean Grandi. Could we, um, Shima, please have ARMO 40148? Um, we can yes. see this is a letter dated the 29th of May 1984 um, from Armour Pharmaceutical Company. It's ref described as, uh, in terms of the subject, being heat-treated factor eight CTX uh, additional investigators, and it's addressed to... Sorry, can we just go up to the top of the page again, Shemek? We can see it's addressed to the medicines division of the Department of Health and Social Security. And then the letter says this, we wish to include the following additional investigators on the above CTX. And then there are three names listed. The second is Dr. Ossia at Bournemouth. The third is Dr. Winter, from whom the inquiry has already uh, heard. Um, but the first name is yours, Dr. Jean Grandi, Westminster Hospital. Um, now, what, if anything, can you tell us about, about this and, and any involvement in the uh, uh, investigation in relation to heat-treated factor eight? Um, thank you, by the way, for sharing this document with me some time ago. I, I regret that I, I can't remember any detail about it, but it's certainly an interesting document, which I find very curious. Clearly, we must have had discussions in the hospital about putting the very few patients we must have had with haemophilia A on a heat-treated product. I note, by the way, that my name is misspelt in this document. It's a CTX, and a CTX, of course, allows a company to carry out a clinical trial using an unlicensed product. What I find odd about it is the fact that my name is on there, because normally a CTX is issued in the name of the consultant or the person in charge of the department. And it's a bit strange for a first-year registrar to be put um, as uh, the named uh, person on a list with much more distinguished and senior people, such as a consultant like uh, Mark Winter, or for that matter, Dr. Later, Professor Osia. So it, clearly it reflects that there must have been discussions in the department about uh, using a heat-treated product before they were supplied by the, um, by the NHS. But sadly, I, I really don't recall um, any discussions. And, and clearly, the UK CDO database records will be able to tell you whether or not we used uh, Factor 8. So you have no recollection of actually being involved as an investigator in the, in the use of the product? I, I'm sorry to say I have no recollection. I say thank you for showing it to me so far in advance, but despite that, I have no recollection of it. Um, now, in 19... Uh, uh, 85, I think we've, you've already referred to your attendance at the AGM of UKHCDO in Oxford. By this time, uh, your statement tells us you were an, a lecturer and honorary senior registrar in haematology at Westminster yeah. and Charing Cross Medical School. Yeah. So what happened, and by the way, my position as lecturer was basically the same as a, as a senior registrar, so it wasn't a purely academic position. Um, my career was a little bit unusual because in those days, most people moved to a different hospital to be a senior registrar um, and often undertook a period of research in between being a registrar and senior registrar. I did the reverse. I did my research after I got my MRC path. And equally, I stayed within the same hospital group. So when a position became available um, as a senior registrar, I applied for that position in the knowledge that I wouldn't just be staying in the Westminster where I think I'd, I'd learnt enough about bone marrow transplantation and I needed greater exposure to general haematology. And I knew that if I got that position, uh, I would be moved to the Charing Cross Hospital and a district general hospital for rotation and a blood transfusion service as well. So I went for the job and I got it and I moved virtually straight away, I think, to Charing Cross Hospital at the end of 1984. Uh, 
before. Uh, and your statement says that you rotated between three hospitals, Charing Cross, Westminster and Roehampton. That's right. And indeed in Roehampton, that's where uh, she then was, Dr Christine Lee was, and I, and I met her there. And she was doing a great job, actually, uh, turning a what was basically a laboratory uh, haematology service into a clinical haematology service. And, uh, and I learned a lot there. And I, that's where I first got to know the now Professor Christine Lee. And to what extent did um, your work during that period uh, at any of those three hospitals involve the care of patients with bleeding disorders? Well, it didn't include haemophilia specifically because uh, Charing Cross and certainly Queen Mary's Roehampton, they were not designated haemophilia uh, uh, centres. But it'd be fair to say that my interest in coagulation as a, as a field developed while I was at uh, Charing Cross um, and you know, there'd be anticoagulant patients, investigation of clotting problems, but I wasn't specifically dealing with any patients with congenital bleeding disorders. Um, you then, I think, took your MRC path qualification in 1986? I did, yes. In the summer, I think about June of 1986, I passed it. And then at the end of 1987, you moved to the Royal Free Hospital as a clinical research fellow under Dr. Kernoff and remained in that yeah. post for two years. What can you tell us yeah. about that work? Well, basically, after I'd got my MRC path, the MRC path is a qualification which is regarded as an exit qualification. So with that, uh, you can then apply technically for consultant positions. I felt a bit young and inexperienced despite that. And more than that, I wanted to develop a, a research uh, interest and indeed go on and, and get a research, higher research degree. And um, the Royal Free Hospital was the place to go, certainly uh, in London at the time. And uh, Peter Kernoff himself, uh, I think, uh, who is sadly missed, was a great leader in that field. And so it's somewhere I, I wanted to go to. Um, and so I wrote to him in, I think, July of that year and asked in 87 whether I could possibly come and... Uh, work in a research capacity there, and he accepted me uh, using their own research funds. Now, I'm going to ask you in a moment about involvement in a recombinant trial, but and before yeah. we get to that, what was the primary focus of the research that you undertook at the Royal Free? It was related to immune function in people with haemophilia and addressing the question about whether treatment could influence the progression of HIV. So, it was related to that important question of whether high purity products could affect the progression of HIV in people with haemophilia. And was that work purely uh, research and laboratory based or did you undertake clinical work in, re in relation to, to, to patients for the purposes of the research? For that research, it was purely laboratory work. So I produced my own monoclonal antibodies, we did flow cytometry, we analyzed blood samples. Um, and I wasn't involved specifically with patients for that aspect. But as you rightly say, after I got to the Royal Free Hospital, uh, Peter Kernoff took on a, uh, a clinical trial involving recombinant factor VIII, and he asked me to take charge of the care of two patients enrolled in that study, which was a, the first brand of recombinant factor VIII to be licensed in this country, which came to be known as Cogenate. And so I looked after them, and actually that formed a chapter of my subsequent MD thesis. And what, what practical clinical involvement did you then have with those patients? Well, I had to follow them closely. So as with all clinical trials, there was a very strict protocol, and I had to arrange the follow-up, the blood tests, and arrange the treatment, the, the supplies. So it was important that we followed the menu, if you like, because that's what a protocol is. It's a very complex menu. Blood samples have to be taken on schedule. So I looked after them for that clinical trial period. Did you, whilst you were at the Royal Free, have any involvement in the care and treatment of patients with HIV um, uh, in relation to their HIV, other than in relation to the, the recombinant trial that you've described? Um, clearly, as with a, a, any you know, research centre, I was, although not looking after the patients, I was closely following and involved in all the clinical meetings about patients and listening to lectures. So absolutely, I would have been involved uh, and as I know you've spoken to uh, Professor Lee and she's told you about the research she was doing. So, of course, I followed that uh, closely. Uh, um, 
we know from other evidence, documentary and indeed Professor Lee's evidence, that the Royal Free Hospital had stored sera samples, um, a, a, essentially a bank of samples that had been built up over a number of years. Did your research or, or any aspect of it involve the use of stored samples? No, I don't believe it did because my work focused very much on looking at the cellular material. So in other words, we were looking at the lymphocytes of patients and the sort of stored samples um, which the Royal Free had um, would not have contained lymphocytes. So I can give a categorical uh, no to that. Uh, and then there's one document from uh, your time there I'm going to invite you to look at. Shomak, it's BAYP 5016 underscore zero one one please and if we can go to the second page please so we can see this is an internal cutter document it's dated the 28th of July 1989. The subject is trip report to the UK 26th and 27th of July 1989. And then it describes a visit to the Royal Free Hospital. Um, and if we could go down the page, please, Shemek. Um, we can see that it refers to a meeting with Dr. Kernoff, uh, Dr. Uh, Gian Grande, um, and um, a sister. Uh, and it refers to concerns Dr. Kernoff was expressing about a patient's liver status. And it goes on to say this, in fact, this problem represents a true matter of conscience for him in an extent which may be considered surprising from a pure medical point of view, considering the, past, the medical past history of this patient. But perhaps understandable from his point of view as he's involved in several civil lawsuits investigating responsibilities for the contamination of haemophiliacs with HIV. This was a confidential remark made by Dr. Jean Grandi after this meeting and the previous one in May. And then the next paragraph refers to Dr. Kernoff having consulted other hepatologists and debated this question in detail with Professor Bloom, whose first reaction when he heard about the patient's problems for the first time had been to suspect CO8HS of being a possible HBV contaminant. Um, and the discussion continues. Now, can I ask you first of all, and without giving any details of the particular patient, um, for, for reasons you'll understand, um, what was the issue here about uh, that was giving rise to particular concern on Dr. Kernoff's part. And, and again, thank you for sharing the document with me some time ago, because originally I had no recollection, but I did find reference to it um, in my thesis, and that's exactly right. So without giving details of the patient away, um, what I can say is that before he embarked on a clinical trial with recombinant factor VIII, um, he had separately, in a separate clinical trial, focusing on factor VIII kinetics, that is, looking at the level, how it decreases over time, been given a batch of CO8HS. Please stop me if I'm giving any details I should not be giving out about the patient. Um, the, uh, a different batch of that product had subsequently been reported as transmitting hepatitis B to a patient in Japan. And this particular patient that I was looking after um, developed um, quite marked uh, abnormalities of uh, liver function tests about three months after receiving the first dose of recombinant factor VIII. And um, at the time, of course, there was no test available for hepatitis C serology. We're talking about the end of 1988, the very beginning of uh, 89. And so the concern was that this patient who was immunosuppressed might have uh, been susceptible to get hepatitis B. And the serological evidence for that was that he was shown, as is underlined in the bottom right of this document, to be anti-HBS negative. That is the antibody that confers protection against the, uh, hepatitis B if it's infused. So the issue was, uh, has this person 
been infected with hepatitis B, or with the related agent, the, the Delta agent. Now, to cut a long story short, um, in retrospect, um, I can tell you, and again, tell me if I am, stop me straight away if I'm saying things I shouldn't be saying, but it was attributed to hepatitis C. Um, and the patient was known to be infected with hepatitis C at the beginning of the trial of recombinant. And it was not really appreciated at the time that people with hepatitis C can have fluctuating uh, abnormal liver function tests. And to cut a long story short, this patient had not been reinfected with hepatitis B. The abnormal liver function tests were attributed to uh, uh, hep prior hepatitis C infection, and this was just a flare-up. Having said that, the patient was uh, withdrawn from the clinical trial of recombinant factor VIII and put back onto his usual brand of factor VIII, which I forgot what it is. I hope that answers your question. It's a bit long. It, it, it does. And um, uh, do you have any recollection of the remark that you're recorded to have made about I'm afraid Dr. Kernel's involvement in uh, But I, I would infer from what is written that perhaps you know, he was w worried that there may be potential medical legal consequences if the patient had been infected with hepatitis B from a product which had been prescribed by himself. And did you have any involvement with the HIV litigation yourself? Are you talking about it in, in general, or are you talking about in... Well, first of, all, first of all, in relation to the period of your employment at the Royal Free? No. Um, and um, more generally, did you have involvement in the HIV litigation? N not in the big, you know, the, the action that was taken. Clearly, there were one or two letters that I was asked to comment on by my trusts when I subsequently moved to Oxford uh, solicitors, but I wasn't involved formally in any HIV litigation. Um, now, following the completion of your work at the Royal Free, you moved in uh, January of 1990 to Milan, where you worked until March 1991, and you were working there with Professor Minucci, uh, mm -hmm. or under Professor Minucci. Yep. What was the nature of your work there, and to what extent was it research-based or clinical? Um, before answering that question, just to set the scene, um, I had been working for... Uh, Dr. Kernoff for two years, which is what he had promised me, um, and we had not been successful in finding uh, a, a further source of uh, income in terms of either we applied to both the Medical Research Council and Action Research, and I needed time to complete my, uh, my thesis. That's what I was keen to do, and so between us, we came up with the idea of going to work in Milan um, for two reasons. Firstly, I speak Italian. My father was Italian. And secondly, because the Milan Haemophilia Centre was and still is one of the most important in the world. And so I went to Italy uh, to do more research work, uh, and I was not registered with the Italian um, General Medical Council equivalent. So I could have been, but I, I, I did not. So my work was uh, essentially laboratory, working in two particular areas. But obviously, I was very closely engaged with the clinical team there, and indeed, two of them in particular became lifelong colleagues, and indeed, I would call them friends. Um, and what were the two main areas of research upon which you were engaged? Well, there were two areas that I started out doing some work in on platelets, but the area I got most involved in was actually looking at um, the porcine factor eight, actually, and a particular uh, aspect of it, and that is... Um, Porcine factor VIII used to treat patients with haemophilia A and inhibitors contains small amounts of uh, pig porcine von Willebrand factor. And the porcine von Willebrand factor, in contrast to human von Willebrand factor, is capable of uh, directly aggregating, uh, agglutinating human uh, platelets. And I was involved in looking at that in some detail. What was the receptor it bound to? It was slightly different from the the binding site for human von Willebrand factor, how could you block it, that sort of thing. And um, it led to an abstract which I presented in an Italian research meeting. It led to a publication in 1992 as well in the British Journal of Hematology. And also I was involved in analysing some data on adverse reactions to porcine factor VIII, which was published in 
again, I think, 1992. Now, we, we've heard Professor Manich's name mentioned, not least in relation to DDABP um, uh, and his publication from, uh, from the, the second mm -hmm. half of the 1970s. Um, um, do you recall any particular um, work or, or, or discussions about the use of DDABP? DDAVP was clearly very widely used uh, in Milan, and I learned a lot about it there. And actually, it was also used in other bleeding conditions, so in people with, say, renal failure, for instance, for re receiving it prior to uh, 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 renal biopsies, a, a practice I introduced in my own hospital when I, when I moved to, to Oxford subsequently. But certainly, I learned a lot about DDAVP. It was quite widely used, and I became very much a convert um, to the use of DDAVP in people with bleeding disorders. Now, there's one document, um, a somewhat curious letter from Professor Manici that I just want to ask you about. Um, ag again, Dr. Giangrandi, you, you, you've, you've seen it and addressed it in your statement, but uh, it's BPLL 305814 underscore 004. Now, th this is a letter um, from Professor Manucci to Dr. James Smith at the Plasma Fractionation Lab in Oxford. And we can see the date is the 3rd of October 1990. And he is referring to a discussion in Sheffield that he'd had with Dr. Smith and an intention to, to treat patients with severe von, von Willebrand disease with 8Y concentrate. Uh, and he says he, he needs, as soon as possible, approximately 50,000 units of the concentrate from the same batch. And then he goes on to say this, as I told you in Sheffield, smuggling, in quotation marks, is the simplest way to avoid the emotional reactions of the customs when they see the word plasma. Perhaps the material could be fetched to Italy in two different occasions to avoid bulky bags. One possible smuggler is Dr. Paul Giangrandi, who commutes to and from London relatively frequently. The other is my associate, Dr. Adrian Gary who will visit London on November the 7th to 8th for a meeting in London. My proposal is that you ask on my behalf Peter Kernoff to store the material in his cold room and that Gringeri and or Giangrande or anybody else pick it up from the Royal Free at the time of their visits to London. In this way, all the material should hopefully visit us, reach us within Christmas. I also realise I shall see you soon in Groningen. Could we start the smuggling with an amount that is feasible both for you and for me? Did you... Did you see this letter at the time, or were you aware of the request being made? Uh, no, I wasn't. And again, thank you for giving me an opportunity to see this letter some time ago. I have subsequently supplied you with an email which uh, Professor Manucci, with whom I stay in close contact, and he uh, uh, confirms what I said in my statement, that this I was never asked to do this. I think it's also important, just to, from a patient perspective, to point out that the product we're talking about here um, is 8Y. It is a common practice for people with haemophilia going on a holiday or abroad for work to uh, take products with them. And I would hate anyone reading this correspondence uh, to be left with the impression that they may be committing an offence by taking their uh, product abroad. But coming back to what you asked me, I was never asked to take... Um, any uh, factor rate uh, uh, from, uh, he never asked me to do it, I can assure you of that. And, and for the sake of completeness, I, sh I will also put on screen Professor Minucci's recent um, correspondence with you on this issue. Uh, it's WITN 33111011. Thank you for showing Minucci's reply. Uh, and if we zoom closer, we can see it's October 2020. And I think this is, you, you, am I right to understand that you've contacted him because as part of the process of asking you to make a statement, the inquiry had sent you the documents we've just looked at? Yeah. Uh, in fact, the date is somewhat later than because you sent me very kindly the document well in advance. But he is now in his 80s and uh, I had difficulty tracking down his up to date email address. And that's why um, it's only dated as recently as October the 5th. I had tried to contact him before that. And it tells us in the second paragraph, I confirm I've never received from you or other people any amount of 8Y, even though, of course, the letter of request that I wrote is a fact and deed that cannot be denied. I do not remember more details about the matter. I may only grasp that at the time I was interested in the comparison of various plasma-derived BWF factor 8 concentrates 
in the correction of the laboratory abnormalities in patients with type, BWD, type 3 BWD, but I know for sure I never managed to use 8Y for this purpose. It is very unfortunate that I did use the word smuggling, which I'm sure that you grasp that in the Italian language, inverted commas are often used to emphasize something rather than to cite literally actual, actual words. In other words, the term is used as a sort of joke without any relationship on the literal significance of the word. Uh, I'm sorry if I caused any trouble to you, but I reiterate once again that you did never fetch any plasma derivative from the UK to Milan when you were with us. Um, on, the, on the face of it, it looks as though uh, this proposal never came to pass. But it was a proposal not for someone to take their own treatment on holiday, but for product which was NHS product given to a hospital for NHS patients uh, to be um, taken to treat other patients in Italy, Italian patients. That was the proposal. Yes. I don't think it helps uh, us in the inquiry one way or the other, but it's a curious letter. Yes. And we don't, I think, know what what, if any, response Dr. Smith made to it. And it's a very strange, uh, on one level, it's a very strange request for uh, a, a clinician to make of another. Uh, the, does it uh, perhaps indicate that the relationships between those people practicing in the field of haematology uh, throughout the world may have become quite familiar with time? Is that a question for me, sir? It is, I think. I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand the question. Well, would, would it's, you... it's, uh, one has to ask why he would be asking or, or expecting, at least on the basis of the first letter, uh, that uh, others would take product from their own health system uh, in order to, to supply a, a fellow haematologist oh. uh, in another system. I, I think he... Again, it's difficult for me to be certain, but I think it's not entirely proven that he's asking the uh, for product to be taken out of stock free of charge from the Oxford Haemophilia Centre's own personal stock. We have to remember that uh, Dr. Smith was working for the uh, PFL, the Plasma Fractionation Laboratory. They were actually making, they were manufacturing this product, and indeed Dr. Smith was very much one of the people involved in the development of 8Y. So my interpretation is he was basically asking for free samples of a product directly from the producer of that product, and in other words, or in order to expedite delivery, to ask somebody who visited the UK fairly frequently or was going over for a meeting basically to act as a courier. That's how I understand it. I don't believe he's asking for... Oxford Haemophilia Centre stock, it's very important to distinguish, and I know we haven't talked about Oxford yet, that at the time, the Oxford Haemophilia Centre was sharply divided. There was the clinical centre, an NHS unit, and there was a production and development laboratory. So th th this is addressed to PFL, it says nothing about, about cost, so he's looking for a free sample, perhaps. Yeah. Jim, uh, but Jim I, Smith... I, 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 t I take your point, and I'm very grateful that you made it. Thank you. Um, but before um, we turn to your appointment in Oxford, um, Dr. Jean Grandy, um, can you um, just assist us with how and when your knowledge of the risks of transmission of hepatitis, and in particular non-A, non-B hepatitis, how had that developed in the course of the, uh, your medical training and, and the um, various research and clinical placements you've told us about? Well, to begin at the beginning, uh, when I was a medical student, one of the medical students I was sharing a house with developed overt hepatitis B with jaundice, and that would have been about 1976. So clearly, uh, you know, I did a lot of reading on the topic at the time and was aware of the distinction between uh, hepatitis A and B. And I was aware at the time that those did not account for all the cases of um, uh, of known hepatitis. When I was working in Manchester as a senior house officer in that rotation where I met Dr. Krask, it was very much a laboratory uh, orientated uh, uh, work that I was doing. And one of my roles was indeed to investigate um, reactions to blood transfusion. There was a form and lots of samples that had to be collected. So, you know, a common reason, well, common is perhaps an exaggeration, but uh, is a, a delayed blood transfusion reaction. So if somebody has 
a low level of antibody against one of the red cell antigens such as Kell or Duffy, um, which hasn't been picked up before the transfusion, a few days later they'll turn slightly pale yellow and, uh, you know, blood tests will be able to be done, which shows that that is the uh, problem. Equally, I was well aware that people could develop um, hepatitis as well after blood transfusion. And there was a standard panel of tests that was done in any suspected blood transfusion like that, and that would include uh, liver function tests. Having said that, I'm sure that many cases of transfusion after uh, blood, blood, uh, the hepatitis after blood transfusion were not picked up simply because the incubation period meant that most patients had left hospital and if they fell ill uh, people would say oh it's because they've had this big operation and many of the patients of course with non-A non-B uh, infected by blood transfusion don't turn yellow and become overtly jaundiced so I was certainly well aware um, of, of that. I have followed in the transcripts and the evidence uh, that has been gone before me of all the work from the 1970s, and I must confess that I was not aware of that. In the era in which I first became exposed to haemophilia in the 1980s, um, actually that was the time, by chance I guess, when many of the publications about non-A, non-B in haemophilia uh, showed that it was you know, relatively benign. I, I remember... Uh, the publication in the British Journal of Hematology, and by the way, it's incorrect in a previous transcript, I believe with Charles Hay, the Manchester publication in the British Journal of Hematology saying liver disease in haemophilia, an overstated problem, was not 1990, uh, 1981, it was December 1983. And I certainly remember reading that because I was back in practice, it was in the British Journal of Hematology, Dr. Crask was one of the authors, as well, of, of course, as the hematologist in Manchester that I knew. So to cut a long story short, um, I was well aware of the concept of non-A, non-B uh, hepatitis by the time I, I graduated, um, but I did not, in my early haematology career, um, appreciate the potential gravity of it. And for me, what transformed the picture was the Lancet publication from Charles Hay and Eric Preston in 1985. Now, you took up your post in Oxford in April of 1991 as yeah. consultant haematologist at the Oxford Haemophilia Centre. Yes. Dr. Ritzer was still there and was the director. Yes. And you replaced Dr. James Matthews. Yes. And uh, when Dr. Ritzer retired in October of 1993, you then took over his role as director of the centre. Yeah. Um, you were the sole consultant there until 1995 when you were joined by Dr. David Keeling. Yes, we had a, uh, we had a locum uh, that joined in between. And you remained in post until your retirement in May of 2015. Yes. Um, now, um, please don't take this next question the wrong way, Dr. June Grandy, but when you took up the post as consultant at what was then either the largest or one of the largest haemophilia centres in the country, is it fair to say that you'd had comparatively little experience in the treatment and clinical management of patients with bleeding disorder? Yes, and I think it's a very perceptive question you ask, because I'll be absolutely frank. Um, when the uh, position came up, actually, I first heard about it from Christine Lee. She phoned me up in Milan and said there is, there is this position. Um, she said, look, it's uh, because uh, I'm going to answer your question in a moment, but just to set the scene... If you'd asked me what I was uh, going to do, my career plan, I thought I would end up, what I wanted was a teaching hospital position to do general haematology. I'd kept my general haematology very active. I'd done a lot of locum positions, even while doing my research at the Royal Free and, uh, and before. Um, and I didn't uh, see myself working exclusively in haemophilia. I thought I'd be a haematologist in a teaching hospital with an interest in clotting. But, and you've asked a very perceptive question, and the important point to make is, I went for it, uh, not really expecting to get it, but a pers persistent problem around this time, and I'm, many others found it, is that people didn't want to go into haemophilia. They found it a rather, I guess, toxic field to go into. Recruitment into the field uh, was simply not easy, and uh, papers have been written about that ever since, actually. Uh, and is 
do we, would we correctly infer that the reason for that is the events of the, the 1980s that we've been examining? Uh, there's absolutely no doubt about that. Publications have been written about it. I mean, it is, as I say, when I applied for that job, uh, and I wasn't the only person to apply, um, but it is astonishing that, for instance, there wasn't anybody as an internal candidate. I mean, it, it commonly happens. These job applications, of course, are put out, uh, but we all know often there are local favoured people. And this is not something just particular to Oxford. Uh, other uh, hospitals around the country and other haematologists who are listening to me now will know exactly what I'm talking about. Papers have been published, not just in the UK, the United States as well. It was a big problem getting people into, uh, uh, into haemophilia. And so you asked a very perceptive question. And I think that um, in many ways, Dr. Ritzer wanted to stay on. I mean, he was older when I started in Oxford than I was when I retired. And I think he felt he had to stay on, uh, firstly, because I do genuinely believe he was a very honourable man. He wanted to sort out the final issue of uh, hepatitis C. And also just to make sure that I was capable of flying solo, to put it that way. Now, I want to ask you a little about Oxford now. Um, you told the Lindsay Tribunal in your evidence in, in 2001 that uh, Oxford, the Oxford Haemophilia Centre had a, a wider responsibility than, than Oxford and Oxfordshire alone. It had responsibility for an area that encompassed Oxfordshire, Berkshire, Buckinghamshire, Gloucestershire and Northamptonshire. Is, is that right? That, right. That was the original. Uh, then Wiltshire joined what became the, the consortium. And then we had quite a few patients that also came from beyond there. But those five counties were the core very much of our patients. We provided very much a regional service, not just Oxfordshire. Uh, and and related to that, by the way, if I may say, um, it's interesting looking at the demographics of people with haemophilia around the country because, you know, Oxford as a county, and so does Northampton, has far more people with haemophilia than you would imagine. And, and it's true to say people actually moved house uh, to be near the first haemophilia treatment centre. Uh, now, um, could you give us a, a, a description of the facilities of the Oxford Haemophilia Centre in 1991 when you arrived? It was uh, a very different from the hospitals I'd worked in before. So the, the Royal Free and uh, Milan Haemophilia Centres were part of very busy, bustling hospitals. The Churchill Hospital was part of the Oxford University Hospitals group. Um, it but the Haemophilia Centre was an isolated building at the periphery of the Churchill Hospital. It was uh, just one floor, which was great for patients, and they loved the easy parking, incidentally, as well. Um, it was a, a purely a haemophilia service for both adults and children, which was uh, quite unusual. The building at the time was divided into two. Um, we had the clinical facilities, um, which were outpatient facilities only. So there were no beds in the haemophilia centre. We had a laboratory and we had three uh, clinic rooms in which to see the patients. And um, we stored the factor eight there. So it was a base to see the outpatients and a base from which we sallied forth to treat patients in the other hospitals in the Oxford group. Uh, so that would include the orthopaedic hospital, the old Radcliffe Infirmary in the centre of town and the John Radcliffe Hospital. But the building was split in two, and the plasma fractionation laboratory occupied the other half. And uh, we were completely separate. You had, I must have gone in that building probably only twice. We had to get the change to go in there. It was the original production facility that made Factor Eight and Factor Nine used uh, in, uh, and sent out to uh, other cities as well. By the time I got there, it was... Um, mainly involved in research and development. So they did make some products for clinical use. There was a factor seven concentrate they made there, which was for use in a small number of patients, and that was used uh, in, in elsewhere in the country. But most of the work there was research and development. It was quite a ramshackle old building, and after the plasma fractionation laboratory closed down in 1992, um, we got funds to refurbish, in fact, demolish part of the old haemophilia centre. And after 1993, we got some spanking brand new premises 
um, which were much better. But it was an outpatient facility purely for the treatment of haemophilia, adults and children, with its own laboratory. And so, br broadly speaking, what, what were the uh, regular outpatient clinics that were held there? How, how often did they take place and how regularly, routinely, would you expect to see patients? The, the typical patient with severe haemophilia would be invited for review um, every uh, six months. And at the time, um, we used to invite that people could choose when to come. So there were no fixed clinics, as you would say. People came uh, when they wanted to uh, throughout the week. But the most important element of the work, as far as I'm concerned, was seeing the uh, the cases that needed to come in for treatment because when I started there prophylaxis was not used we did have home treatment and so the number of patients seen with bleeds was much higher than the current staff would experience now for instance so it was a mix of I guess the the important part of the work there were three elements to it it was the regular six monthly reviews it was going out to treat inpatients mainly in the orthopedic hospital but elsewhere and then dealing with the urgent cases and people could come whenever they wanted. We had uh, open access. Six months was the rule for adults um, and uh, there, uh, for children it was more frequently, typically about um, every three months. And then in addition, that, and this had been a long-standing arrangement and a very important one, there was a regular liver clinic with uh, Dr Joan Trowell. That was always on a Tuesday morning and so patients were followed up by Joan Trowell they would come for their follow-ups on the Tuesday so that we could do it at the same time. But that was the only other clinic which we held at that time in the Haemophilia Centre itself. And how was the relationship with the other counties for whom Oxford had a, had a responsibility? How was that managed? What in practical terms did responsibility for Buck, Buckinghamshire or, or, or Gloucestershire it worked, entail? It worked extremely well. Firstly, let's look at it from the professional point of view, and then I'll look at it from the financial point of view. The way things worked then was that we had a very good network of doctors, many of whom had trained in Oxford as senior, uh, not necessarily students, but they'd done senior registrar or other jobs, and then they moved to the region, and that helped foster long-term bonds. And uh, we also had a regular, what it was called, a blood club, and this would also help bond those professional links. So we would meet every you know, six months or so uh, to discuss cases and that sort of thing. I have to say, in later years, um, the way you know, the NHS develops, those bonds were unfortunately ripped apart because the way the system developed, instead of letting those natural bonds develop, for instance, we were told that Northampton and Kettering should really develop links with Leicester because of the way the funding flowed. And similarly, there was a pull from Gloucestershire towards Bristol. And equally, we were expected to develop links with Southampton, which we hadn't previously got links with. From a financial point of view, it worked extremely well. And we were very fortunate. And I'd like to pay tribute to the late Kendall Bird, who really helped us. He helped up, sorry, he helped develop what was called the Oxford Consortium. Because when fund holding became a reality in the NHS in 1993, individual GP practices were taking on a huge risk if they were looking after patients with haemophilia because the expenditure could go up and down in a shocking way for an individual patient. And therefore, the concept was formed of having a consortium pooling the risk so that people funding haemophilia care in, say, the whole of Gloucestershire would know very much, on the, you know, they'd have a very good idea of what they were going to spend uh, on haemophilia in a given year. So from a financial point of view, Developing consortium allowed the sharing of risk and making sure that there wouldn't be unexpected calls for large sums of money for people with haemophilia. So I have to say the relationship worked extremely well on both planes. It, just going back to what you told us about the blood club, Dr Gian Grandi, um, as I understand it, that's doctors meeting from not just from Oxford, but from the, these other areas. Uh, absolutely. I'm sorry if I didn't make that clear. So what would happen is someone would host it in their hospital. So each centre has a, an education, each hospital rather, would have a, an education building or something. So it would be, you know, we'd go to Milton Keynes and they'd, they'd put on a buffet there and we'd have a few, you know, hear about cases. It was a social event as well as an academic event. And was that something which had, as far as you know, existed for, 
for a number of years when you arrived oh, in yes. 1991? Yes, that, 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 yes. Um, in, in terms of other staffing at the uh, Oxford Haemophilia Centre, obviously Dr Ritzer was still in charge when you arrived and, and until his retirement. Um, what other staff uh, arranged? Uh, what other staff were available to you at the centre? Okay, so when I started, uh, the arrangement was that we had two junior doctors. They were called senior house officers, and they were actually very good. They they worked. Uh, they spent six months with us, so they were the junior doctors. It was a single. It was their only job was a six month job working in the haemophilia centre, and then we had um, three nurses one of whom was the conventional unit nurse, if you like, dressed in a nurse's uniform, who ran a very tight ship and ran all the aspects of the internal workings of the haemophilia centre from a nursing perspective. And she also ran the home treatment programme, that is, she would box up products to be sent off to patients by courier, because we did that from an early day. We had um, uh, then two other nurses, who uh, would do home visits. In fact, in those days, remarkably, we even had a unit car. There was some you know, crown allowance system. So we had a car, and the nurses would do uh, home visits. Um, then, of course, we had our own laboratory. Uh, we had a manager. Uh, and then we had other people we had close links, but they weren't employees. I'm sure we're going to come on to it, but, for instance, a social worker funded specifically for HIV. But in terms of employees, the ones I would highlight would be the two junior doctors the three nurses who had differing roles and the laboratory staff as well as a manager of course. And what was the position in relation to the social work support? We had a lady uh, whose name I can tell you if you want it but um, she was funded specifically uh, by Oxfordshire County Council to deal with uh, patients and support patients with HIV. She was in post when I arrived and had been there for some years and she remained with us until the late 1990s. Um, after she left, uh, that position was not uh, filled again. Uh, um, when you say dealing with patients with HIV, was that patients with HIV across the board, whatever the uh, cause of the uh, HIV, or just haemophilia patients? Well, in practice, that's a very good question, and I think the answer is going to be, in effect, it was just the people with haemophilia, because one of the strange things about Oxford and we'll talk about it later, uh, I'm sure when we come to talk about HIV uh, among our patients, is that we had the luxury of being able to set up a dedicated clinic for patients with haemophilia and HIV because the other at-risk categories didn't really feature high on the agenda, if you like, in terms of numbers within Oxford. The, 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 the number of patients unfortunately exposed to HIV with haemophilia was much higher than other risk groups. So to my knowledge... At that time, this particular social worker really devoted her time to people with haemophilia. Uh, in terms of psychological support, there was no uh, psychologist or specialist counsellor attached to the centre? That, that's correct. Um, there was a doctor, I never met him, a Dr Catalan, who had done a number of MRC-funded research projects which led to publications, but he had left Oxford by the time I left. I did try on two occasions uh, to explore avenues of getting uh, psychologists involved. The problem was, in fact, I met up with, let's say, two uh, psychiatrists. The problem was that they had very specific uh, provision of psychological services. So, for instance, near us, there was a unit that dealt with children, the assessment of children with developmental problems, or they would be... Uh, clinical psychologist to look after people with uh, addiction problems, for instance. But unfortunately, uh, I was never able to secure specific psychological uh, input for uh, our patients. And even the psychiatrists, when I approached them, you know, sometimes some of our patients, quite unrelated to haemophilia, had you know overt psychiatric problems, and they were helpful there, but not for the general uh, cases. But I would have to say that our nurses were really brilliant and rose to the challenge. And it's very important to emphasize that our nurses, and one of them in particular who was a trained psychotherapist, provided fantastic support for our patients. And I, I believe any of my former patients watching now, I, I hope they would agree with me. They went beyond the usual role of nurses. They became close friends and confidants of many of the patients. 
what, if any, discussions did you have with Dr. Ritzer um, about um, the position of the cohort of patients, the large cohort of patients who'd been infected with HIV as a result of their treatment at Oxford? Um, was there any discussion with Dr. Ritzer about, about those events in those years? Uh, not really, uh, if, if I'm honest. Um, it was, uh, no, it's not something that he and I discussed in any detail. I, I no. Um, so carry on. I, I was going to say, you know, one of the things I did when I went to Oxford is I did feel that uh, we could do more for the patients with HIV in terms of setting up um, a clinical follow-up. I mean, in hepatology, that had certainly been a dedicated service that had been set up some years before. Um, actually, not just some years, it had been a long step because Dr. Trowell, who was deeply embedded in the haemophilia world, knew a lot about haemophilia, knew all the patients well. But with HIV, I rather felt that the there was no... Pr there was no formal link with the infectious diseases team, which actually was based right next door to us. So one of the first things I did when I started in Oxford was to set up a dedicated um, follow-up clinic. Initially, that was with Dr. Pito, or through Dr. Pito. In reality, uh, the clinics were run by a senior registrar called Dr. Lutzi, that's L-U-Z-Z-I. And then Dr. Chris Comlin was appointed, I think, in about 1995. But what we did was to hold these clinics on a Wednesday morning, and I would sit in with Dr. Lutzi or Dr. Conlon, and we would see the patients um, together. But I did not really discuss the events of the early 1980s with Dr. Ritz, so it's not something he, he did with me. Um, so I note the time. I'm going to look at some of Dr. Giangrandi's evidence to the Lindsay Tribunal with him next, so this might be a convenient point at which to take the, the uh, morning break. Yes, yes, indeed. So... Um, we, we take a mid-morning break. Uh, I'm sure you could probably do with one, but certainly uh, there will be those who are watching who would appreciate a break. Well, it's normally half an hour, so we'll come back, if we can, please, uh, at quarter to 12. So quarter to 12. Oh, sir, could you give Dr. Gian Grandi the normal uh, yes. warning? Yes. Uh, I tell everyone at this stage, you may have heard me do it uh, if you've been watching it all online, that um, you're in the middle of evidence. Uh, what you must not do is discuss anything that you have said in evidence or anything you think you may yet be asked to say in evidence with anyone, whoever they are, but you can talk about anything else you like. I'll see you at quarter to 12. Uh, that, that, by the way, applies at every break. <laughs>